good morning. Today is Monday, November the 8th, and it's good to be with you. I hope you had a good night's rest. I did. Um, looking forward to a full week, and we are fast approaching the holidays. We're uh, probably, I think, maybe my favorite holiday of the year is Thanksgiving, and so looking forward to spending that. It's not too far away. Just want to encourage you to remember to pray for those that we've been mentioning every week. Constantine, as he's recovering, and Leah, Leah, I think you had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday to you. And um, praying for Vanessa. She is now having chemo treatment every Tuesday, so remember to pray for her every week uh, as she's going through that. So many other prayer requests, you know those. I encourage you to reach out to people that maybe you haven't seen sometime, seem to kind of disconnected during this uh, season of time. Uh, this morning, I just want to start with one that uh, just, I just love. It may perhaps be my favorite old hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. This is my story and this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. What a what a great line. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This morning we're picking up in John chapter 12 and we're going to pick up at the 12th verse. You remember this is beginning to take place after uh, 
Mary, the sister of Lazarus, had anointed Jesus' feet with expensive alabaster perfume. It was used for, as an embalming agent, or uh, not necessarily embalming, but uh, to anoint one who had been laid in a tomb. And it was a foreshadow and really in some ways prophetic as to, I think she realized or maybe had the idea that Jesus was going to um, face his death. Maybe she didn't fully understand, but she was led to do that. And the very next day, they they leave that area, probably Bethany, most likely, where Lazarus and Mary and Martha's uh, home were. It was the day of the Feast of Passover was about to take place. And that Monday leading into the week, Jesus enters into Jerusalem. You remember there are many times where Jesus had made the statement, my time has not yet come. And he would depart an area, uh, meaning that his time uh, to, to face the passion or the cross had not yet come. But now Jesus recognizing that that time had come, he enters into Jerusalem. Verse 12 says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written, or just as it had been prophesied. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, meaning when Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, after his crucifixion, when he was glorified, when they remembered that these things had been written about him and he had done uh, what had been done to him, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. In other words, they continued to talk about Lazarus being raised from the dead. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, many believed in a Messiah as one that would be a political uh, ruler. They, they knew that Messiah would, would uh, sit on the throne of David. And of course, this time the Jews were under uh, the rule of the Romans and they had occupied Jerusalem. And undoubtedly, they, they believed that, that Jesus was a Messiah that had come to establish his kingdom, even as some of his own disciples believed that he was coming to establish a political or earthly kingdom. And they misunderstood what had been prophesied about Jesus. And so the, the people of Jerusalem had heard of the miracle of him raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Jesus takes a donkey, and as he's entering into the city, they lay palm branches. That's where we have Palm Sunday. Uh, they laid palm branches down, and they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So they looked at Jesus as a an earthly king. And no doubt, Jesus will once again reign as an earthly king in the millennial kingdom after the tribulation period. Uh, which is preceded by the rapture of the church, and at his second coming, he will enter into Jerusalem. And we believe that the Bible teaches that there'll be a literal 1,000-year reign where Jesus reigns on the throne in Jerusalem. But that time was not now in, in this story. And so Jesus enters in, and the Pharisees note what they, they realize. All of their means of method of trying to quieten Jesus or bring the bring the crowds of the popularity away from him, they're upset and they say, look, the world has gone after him. And I love that. You see, there's nothing that can hold back the advancement of the kingdom of God. We have seen it through church history many times where Christianity has been oppressed. The message of the gospel has been oppressed in recent history and the communist bloc countries um, still today in China and other nations around the world and the Middle East under Islam, where there are those that try to to squash out God or, or quelch the message of the gospel. 
it cannot be contained. It cannot be thwarted. It can't be brought down because it is an act of God. And even in our own nation, I think we're beginning to see signs of suppression of the gospel. And I believe it's going to get worse as the years go on. But the message of the gospel cannot be contained because it's not a man-made message. It is God brought and God delivered. And so at this effect, verse 20, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them. And he says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now the hour has come. Um, for him to be glorified. Now, it's kind of odd to think of the Son of Man being glorified by going to the cross. But Paul says that the message of the cross is the power of God, that God demonstrated his power through the cross. Now, what does that mean? It means that God demonstrated his power over sin and death through sacrifice and the shedding of his son's blood on the cross. When we think in, in man's terms, we would never think or imagine that the power of God would be, be displayed through the death of his own son. We might see that as a defeat, but God works in those ways. You see, it was necessary for God to send his son, Jesus, that he would shed his blood as a payment and as atonement for the sins of the world that the wrath of God would be poured out on Jesus as all of mankind's sin was laid on Jesus and that he would be buried and he would be raised again on the third day, conquering death, which was a penalty for sin. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, there was a decree that was announced. There was a judgment that came, and that judgment was death, both spiritual death, separation from God, and physical death. But now on the cross and through the resurrection, Jesus would conquer both physical and spiritual death. Verse 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And here Jesus is talking about himself. You see, it was necessary for him to die so that there would be many that would be brought into the kingdom of God, that for all of those who would hear the gospel message and place their trust in what Christ has done, they would be born again. Had Jesus not gone to the cross and suffered death, we would all, every human being in all of human history, would, would, would forever be shut out from relationship to God and would be damned in an eternity of hell, in hell, separated from God for all of eternity. But one grain of wheat fell to the ground, and it died so that many might be born again. Thank God this morning that He drew you, the Father drew you, and He opened your eyes and your heart that you could hear the message of the gospel. He quickened your heart, convicted you of sin, caused you to repent, turn from your sin, and trust Christ. That that never gets old. I'll start preaching in just a minute. But man, I, I, I don't know. I, I've been saved, I don't know how many years now, 37, 38 years. And the message of the gospel just does not get old. As a matter of fact, it gets sweeter and sweeter every day. You know why it gets sweeter and sweeter every day? Because I realize more and more every day how much of a wretched sinner that I am. And apart from the grace and the shed blood of Christ, I deserve an eternal damnation. But God has saved me. Rejoice in him today that he saved you. Verse 25, whoever loves his life will lose it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Two things here. If anyone loves his life, he will lose it. You see, when God calls us to him, he calls us to die to our own life. 
He calls us in that sense to crucify our life in Him and live for Him. You see, we cannot have Jesus and have our own life at the same time. Jesus demands, He requires of us to surrender our life to Him and to make Him Lord of our lives. And so the person that's wanting to hold on to their own life and maybe just have Jesus as a tag-along in their life, they're not born again. They just simply want God for the benefits that they might get out of God. You see, there's not a desire to surrender to Him as Lord. But He declares Himself to be Lord and Master. And if we're to follow him, we have got to recognize and acknowledge and yield our lives to him every single day as Lord. He says in verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be disciples, to be followers of Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, then you'll obey my commands. And I'm the first to admit that I don't always obey his commands. And I hope you agree with that in your own life. But thank God for his grace and his mercy. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that woos us, draws us back to him because left on our own, none of us would follow Christ. Thank God for the Holy Spirit today. Well, I pray the Lord blesses you and he keeps you. I've uh, got an important meeting this morning at 9.30. Uh, with someone who's interested in knowing how to be born again, how to have a relationship with God. And so would you pray over that time that uh, myself and a couple of others have with that, uh, those individuals. I pray the Lord would bless you. Uh, would he give you an opportunity, ask God for an opportunity today to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart and in their life that God would give you the wisdom when you recognize that a seed has been planted of how to cultivate that seed. And man, if God by his grace would allow us to see somebody saved today, oh my goodness, that would just make my day. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you. I look forward to being with you tomorrow morning in our devotion time. Have a great day.